me is that most of the animals that live here are here because they have to be here. And this is their, um, some of them were injured in the wild, some of them were illegally smuggled into the United States, um, some all had, they all had their own little special story to tell. And we thought, you know, since we've had our bobcat for about a year here, we really wanted to, you know, educate people about just how magnificent our, our only, you know, native wild cat is. And, and we were really fortunate to find a, a person who was uh, the perfect uh, a, a person to come in and, and give us a talk. Um, big thanks to Sandy in the back, who put this whole thing together for the most part. Uh, makes my job easy. And for all my other stuff, <laughs> And also all the staff, uh, they have, uh, some of the staff here raise your hand. Uh, they've also been really uh, instrumental in putting this whole thing together and keeping things looking good here. And we're really lucky to have such good people uh, with us. So thank you very much. Um, a couple things, we've got some new things going on. We have lots of new programs and camps coming up. Um, thanks to the City Lake Forest, they freed up some uh, capital equipment money that we can upgrade. Some of our exhibits that you'll see, or we have already seen. Uh, we're also getting ready to uh, put up all these signage around the building, uh, around our exhibits, that are going to look a lot snazzier than they used to be. And uh, we're going to have these, you know, so we have a lot of neat information about all the different animals here. And uh, once again, Sandy, our marketing coordinator, is working on that project. And uh, we're really hoping to get this thing done in the next few weeks. Um, before I forget, uh, you're welcome to. Finish up the cookies in the back and get some juice afterwards. Uh, help yourself. Um, if anyone is looking to get a uh, one of our official hats or a T-shirt or anything like that, uh, we've got stuff for sale, and Sandy can help you out afterwards. Um, and we, once again, we really do thank you for coming out, and supporting this, uh, supporting our efforts. And I'd like to introduce our special guest tonight. Um, I had a chance to spend some time with Kevin today, and uh, he's just a really neat guy. He and I have a lot in common. Um, I had a good time showing him around and he shared a lot of stories and I quickly realized that this is a guy that's done a lot of things in, in, in the field of uh, wildlife conservation and biology and things like that. And um, so I don't leave anything out and then I read a few of uh, the accomplishments and the things that he's done <coughs> to give you an idea of what he's, uh, what he's been doing. Um, Kevin Hansen has worked as a wildlife biologist, park ranger, professional speaker, and writer throughout the United States. Uh, he's a recognized authority on the natural history and management of mountain lions and bobcats. Uh, he has lectured at over 500 venues. Uh, of course, ours is the best one yet, right? Okay. And uh, including the California Academy of Sciences, uh, University of Colorado, Grand Canyon National Park, Rio Grande Nature Center, San Diego Natural History Museum, University of Texas, and the Phoenix Zoo, and probably some others that uh, I didn't mention. Um, as a wildlife biologist, he has studied birds of prey in Oregon, uh, feral burrows in Death Valley, mountain lions in Arizona, bobcats in California, uh, my favorite, alligators in the uh, Everglades, uh, and also the Florida Panther there. Uh, he's also the former manager of the uh, Los Palmas Preserve, which is a uh, 15,000 acre wildlife refuge and nature preserve near California's uh, Salton Sea. Um, as a park ranger with the National Park Service and Bureau of Land Management, Kevin has worked in Death Valley, Everglades, the Summit National Parks, as well as the Sonoran Desert National, National Mon Monument. Uh, he has written and presented over 4,000 public presentations on subjects from butterflies to whales, and tonight we'll be looking at bobcats. Uh, he is the author of Cougar, the American Lion, uh, which is published by Northland, uh, which is a definitive book on the biology and behavior of mountain lions. Uh, his wildlife and natural history articles have been published in a variety of national magazines. Uh, the latest book, Bobcat, Master of Survival, uh, is a comprehensive overview of bobcat ecology and management in North America. I had a chance to read this. It is an outstanding book. I mean, he definitely, uh, Kevin's got the, the knack for writing, and I would definitely encourage you to, uh, uh, if you like natural history and just learning more about our native wildlife, it's a, a must uh, have in your library. Um, you can probably get it on Amazon or Oxford University. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Kevin currently is a resident of Las Cruces in Mexico, and uh, and he's a professional speaker, and writer, and jack of all trades when it comes to natural history types of things. So uh, let's give a big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> also, one more thing: we're going to hold a lot of questions until we end the program. Uh, that way, you can kind of get. You've got lots of slides to show, then we'll open up to questions. Does that sound good? Sounds good. All right, I'm going to be your, your slide person. 
Wow, I'm impressive. <laughs> Some people are impressed with my resume. My parents always just want to know why I couldn't hold a job. So. <clears throat> First thing we do is we want to calibrate the acoustics in the room. Can you hear me in the back? Yep. No one has ever complained about my inability to project. But uh, so everybody can hear me fine? Yep. I'd like to thank Rob and his staff for having me here. I get to talk about my favorite animal in the world. And meeting Boris was, uh, who immediately climbed on my face. <laughs> and uh, hey, these, these cats know it. I'm a cat person, not a dog person. But big cats, not little cats. So here they are in the bed. And uh, bobcats are kind of a mystery. Uh, I was doing a, uh, I was actually coming home from a CPR class in Flamingo, Florida, in the Everglades one night, when a Florida panther stepped in front of my truck. But that's not a big deal out where I live now, because mountain lions are relatively common, but Florida panthers are incredibly rare. So that, that led to me uh, getting carried away. I was asked to write a brochure on mountain lions, and that turned into a book. Uh, and while I was working on lions, I kept running into this guy, the bobcats. And uh, Rob and I were talking about this today. There's, there's actually been a lot of work done on bobcats, and probably some of the very best work done on bobcats is here in Illinois, believe it or not. There's been some researchers. But when I have tried to get uh, information or comprehensive, asking people, like, oh, how do they go? What's going on? I, I get different answers. So I wrote a book to kind of pull it all together. And one of the first things I noticed was, man, there's a lot of literature available, much more than there was with mountain lions. Uh, but a lot of it was very repetition, repetitious and redundant. I'm going to talk about why. And not, bobcats are kind of coming into their own. It's, uh, they're sort of starting to earn some respect. And game and fish departments are being called upon to take more care with uh, a lot of our non-game animals. Uh, Bobcat is what's called a fur bear. They've been killed and trapped for their fur. I didn't think that took place on a very big scale until I did a little research and found out uh, the fur trade. It was that was a, that was one of my biggest educations. So what I like to do with your indulgence is introduce you to a friend of mine, Bobcat. Master of Survival. Or, is the lighting okay? Can yes. everybody see? Ta da! Rob, get it. This is the guy we're talking about. This is called Bobcat. That's short for Bob's Hill <coughs> Cat. It's a small, the, the males, they don't get anywhere big, as big as people think they do. An adult male Bobcat running around in Illinois weighs 22 pounds. So, it's kind of like any cat. You hit them with a water hose, they lose half their weight. They kind of look strong. And uh, they have something called sexual dimorphism. That's a fancy way of saying the males and the females physically look different. Whereas males will average about 22 pounds, females will average about 17. So there's a size difference. Uh, the, the lynx family, the scientific name for this is lynx rufus. And we don't do that just to show off. There's a reason. There's a science of taxonomy, how we classify animals. And what I first want to do is sort out the lynx group for you. There's four existing lynxes, except for the ones that are missing. <laughs> oh, we got them. I tell you what. Hey, don't turn on me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the one we're going to be talking about. Let's talk about some of the others. It used to be that the way biologists would sort of categorize animals, if you want to start a fight, just bring up cats. Um, so we have a new tool. Everybody that watched on CSI lately? Molecular genetics. It's not being just used on people, it's being used on animals. And now we know where cats come from. And they've actually evolved in eight lines. And the one I'm going to talk about is the lynx lineage, which gives us four existing species today. One's the bobcat, Canada lynx, Eurasia lynx, and Iberian lynx. It's the four that exist today. That's the big guy. This is the Eurasian lynx. They can get up to 40 pounds. Now, these are the ones that have probably the largest range of any of the cats. They're found across, well, this, is called, well, this is called an old world cat. It's found all the way from Scandinavia over, the, over to Korea, then the Sakhalin Peninsula in Russia, across Siberia, well down into the Himalayas, all over Turkey, and uh, the Swiss government is introducing them to Switzerland right now. So next one. From the most common one to the rarest, 
This is the rarest cat in the world. This is the Iberian lynx. I just happen to have a couple friends working on this project, and you saw that when I use the term range, I'm referring to the entire geographic area an animal is found, as opposed to home range. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. You saw how big the range was for the Iberian lynx, for the uh, Eurasian lynx. Look at this. There's only a couple hundred left. But uh, we tend to think most of what's going on with wildlife is going on in the United States. Well, the Spanish government is pouring billions of dollars into reestablishing this cat. As a matter of fact, they just had their first two captive releases in this area of Spain. And they're doing well. So uh, maybe we'll be able to bring that one back in the break next. Now we're going to jump over to the New World cats. This is the Canada lynx. They look like a bobcat, kind of, sort of. Uh, they're almost the same size, except they have great big feet. They look like they have frying pans or snowshoes tied to the feet. And this is an animal built for the cold and the snow. And that's usually what separates bobcats to the south and cattle lakes to the north. Uh, not just along the Canadian United States border, but snow and the depth of snow and cold is what separates them. They do exist in the same area. We have a fancy name for that sign. It's called their Sympatrick, which means they're both found in the same area. But uh, Canada Lakes has a, a pretty big area. It's found throughout, across Alaska, uh, Canada. You can see there's this big gap in Saskatchewan, and that's the big uh, grasslands in the area. And they're found, Colorado has just done a massive reintroduction of Canada Lakes into Colorado. And uh, some of them have found their way into New Mexico. So here in New Mexico, we got Canada Lakes now. We also have Jaguars. But, uh, and then finally, this is the one we're going to be talking about. This is the bobcat. And the bobcat has the largest range of any of the cats in North America. Well, and if you looked at a range map, they're also probably, you've got to remember about there's 38 species of cats in the world. Half of those are either in trouble or they have a subspecies that's in trouble. The bobcat is exactly the opposite. They're actually expanding the range. So I have a happy story to tell you about cats are actually in good shape, probably throughout the range. As a matter of fact, there used to be a great big hole right here across Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and they were protected. And we think that's because of the intense agriculture. Uh, it may not be obvious to a lot of people, but uh, agriculture is kind of shifting its practices, and we're leaving more of the hedgerows and more cover. Uh, when I called Dr. Clay Nielsen down at uh, Southern Illinois University, I said, well, according to my range map here, you would have to know bobcats in Illinois. And he said, that's funny, I've got 36 of them radio collared right now. <laughs> so you got to be covering to look at these books, and bobcats seem to be making a comeback in Illinois. In fact, they're doing quite well. Oh, oh come on, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Except that's what a lot of people misinterpret. Rob and I were talking about this today. Is, People tend to think of wildcats in terms of domestic cats. When you look at that, it's isn't it cute. What he's really thinking is, I want to remove your face. <laughs> or, or get that camera out of my face. Because one of the things wildcats do have is a lot of attitude. Uh, I was in with Boris today, and Rob was watching how tentative I was being because I know how quickly their personalities change. I have the scars to prove it, so does Rob. Next. <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting thing. There wasn't a lot of interest in bobcats until about 1970. Um, their fur wasn't a great value. They weren't attacking a lot of eating people's chickens and stuff like that. And then in 1973, this is just for the history here. What great thing, what big environmental thing happened in 1973 dealing with wildlife? The kids know this. This will be on the test. The Endangered Species List. The Endangered Species Act was passed. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service enforces the Endangered Species Act for the United States. And the four existing, I've actually thrown in an extra, uh, the bobcat's doing fine, it's not listed. The Mexican bobcat, it's a subspecies, is listed as endangered. The Canada lynx is listed as threatened. Spanish lynx, very endangered. And then the Eurasian lynx is not listed, it's doing quite well. There's an international organization like our US Fish and Wildlife Service. There's an international agency called the World Conservation Union that tracks wildlife around the world, and they give similar classifications. But another thing that happened in 1973, a lot of people don't know about in the United States, 
was a bunch of countries around the world got together and they formed and agreed to and signed the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. And what that is, is they agreed on marketing. <clears throat> we sell and trade wildlife in the billions of dollars every year throughout the world. And the way this is controlled is all the signatory nations agree to certain restrictions. There's three lists. And animals are placed on one of three lists. If it's Appendix 1, that animal is critically endangered and everybody agrees there will be no trade. Elephants, for instance. Appendix 2, that means some trade will be allowed, but we'll monitor it very carefully. Well, the way that works with bobcats here in the United States, if you kill a bobcat and sell its fur, you have to attach a special tag to it if it's sold internationally. That's all monitored very carefully. And then Appendix 3 is it's Dodge City and we can do what we want. And that has actually protected cats a lot. So you'll hear me talk about the Endangered Species Act and CITES a lot. And what happened when this law was passed, the Endangered Species Act was passed about the mid-1970s, CITES they came up in about the mid-1970s. Uh, what happened was um, the trade in the trade in cat fur collapsed because you couldn't trade in African lions and jaguars because they were all protected now. And furriers around the world shifted, and we started hammering bobcats like you wouldn't believe. Bobcats and animals it started in 19, 1975, and this is what happened. The average this is a bobcat in a trap. This is how it's done. I'm not going to dress it up for you. It's, it's ugly. You've ever seen it. But yearly harvest of bobcats went from 10,000 to close to 90,000 cats a year. So this <coughs> led to some very hard questions being asked. And this is where another historical event took place. A lot of people aren't aware of That's where your federal government stepped in on the state governments, which is really a big no -no. Because the way we read the law, and the law in Illinois is no different, is the bobcats belong, all wildlife belongs to the people of the state of Illinois. And the state is usually given authority to manage wildlife. Well, this is one where the Fed stepped in and said, no. And if you're going to continue to kill them on this scale, you've got to prove to us that this level of harvest, as they call it, is not damaging populations. And that, that led to a big cat hunt uh, among agencies. Next. So what happened is, here's this harvest. It was like it just really increased. Well, what happened at the same time was research. So that was a positive. But when I started asking questions, I said, what, did you just all of a sudden get interested in bobcats? So you guys started doing a lot of research? Or were you trying to justify those massive harvest levels? Oh, we just got into bobcats. You okay. start to wonder. But there was some really good work done. And some of it was done here in Illinois. Um, bobcats are live trapped. Uh, Dr. Alan Wolf at Southern Illinois University and one of his graduate students, Clay Nielsen, who's now, Alan Wolf passed away from cancer a few years ago. And uh, Clay Nielsen is now a professor down there and he carried, it was an eight year study done in Illinois. Uh, I'm cheating here. This is a study being done in Northern California in a place called uh, the Marine Headlands, north of San Francisco. This is Dr. Seth Riley, uh, ultimate bobcat wrangler, as we call him. And uh, bobcats are caught in these live traps and we collect a lot of data. Um, we also study tracks. Looking at cat tracks is really interesting. I teach animal tracking, and uh, bobcats have this real annoying habit. All cats do this if you look at their tracks, is they do something called direct register. And that is their rear foot almost always steps on or near the front foot. That's why you don't get a nice clear track. You usually get these two tracks. But the definitive characteristic of a bobcat track, the way they always tell them it's a bobcat track, is bobcats will always leave a buck knife and a measuring tape. <laughs> to tell you, this is indeed a bobcat trap. Uh, we have another tool available to us. These are infrared cameras. We're using these to track jaguars along the Mexican-American border. It's a project I'm involved in. But the bobcats, usually, I, I, I pick this one, but my favorite one is where the cats come up to the camera and go, <laughs> get their photo taken at night. And uh, we, we draw blood, we collect blood. We're building these DNA banks where we actually are tracking. This helps us track subspecies and what's going on. We're, we're building a big DNA base with uh, white-tailed deer, mule deer, mountain lions, bobcats. It's going on with a lot of uh, animals. Check their teeth, paw, you know, make sure. It's important to have fangs but you can't function as a predator. And of course, we're using radio telemetry. This used to be, and this is getting much better, 
Uh, used to be, we're just attaching a radio transmitter and then we follow it around. But we have these new fancy collars called satellite collars, and we can actually track the animals from the satellite. And it actually is giving us even more data about what the animal's doing and, and where it's found. A uh, couple things we've learned. Uh, I worked in a wildlife rehab center near Scottsdale, Arizona, and we have 28 different bobcats in captivity. These are confiscated cats and so forth. And one of the things that astounded me is how different they look. They really, really vary. They're not the same. And here in uh, Illinois, you probably, they probably look like this. They're, you got this gray background, but down where I'm from, you get this tawny, get this tawny brown. So, tremendous variation, uh, about the same size. You see how he, he looks a little more alive and a little skinnier. That's probably heat management, that can manage heat. But we also think it has to do with sunlight exposure. In the hardwood forest, the old story of the hardwood forest in the northeastern United States, is a squirrel could run from Maine to Missouri and not touch the ground. So it was very, very lush. Well, where I come from, if you have a tree, you're not going because it's very, very dry. They're very, very uh, agile. Um, if you look at a bobcat to the side, their butt looks higher than the rest of the body. Their rear legs, I watched the boris, it's really pronounced. You can see his, his, his butt is up in the air. And that gives them tremendous jumping ability. They, they love, they are very good climbers to share. How good a climber they are? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a swallow cat that's up close? <laughs> Uh, all those, all those ribs you see right here have these collections of spines like that. So this is my image. As he was running up there, it's going, like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> but, but he, he gets up there, which also says something about how tough bobcats are. Yeah, so, but I just love that shot. <laughs> so they're very good at climbing, and they have predators like the dogs, dog packs mostly, and then mountain lions and people mostly. This is where we see bobcats where I'm from. Uh, along the Bosque, along the Rio Grande. Uh, Bosque is the term you use here as riparian or riverine. The thick forests here in Illinois, 38% uh, of the state was covered by hardwood forest and that broken up by prairie. And then that was all bisected by your rivers. And then these thick forests would go along the river. Uh, I commented to roll out today that what this, re this reminds me very much of a place I used to live, which surprises people, is the Central Valley of California. Illinois looks like the Central Valley of California. Very, very similar, sort of a uh, prairie area, probably these thick forests that would run along the rivers. And bobcats love that area because that's where you get what bobcats eat. This is, uh, by the way, I would like to give a shout out to the woman who provided most of these photographs. Her name is Susan Morse. She's a wildlife photographer from Vermont. And probably one of these, she's a master tracker. Uh, the tribes from Africa invite her over to teach workshops on tracking. And she taught me how to track. She's just scared to be out in the woods. How uh, good she is and what she do. The amount of, they never, you'll never hear them use the term tracking. They use the term cutting signs and reading, literally reading the animal landscapes like it's a book. It's really kind of neat to, to be out with these people. Uh, within the range of the bobcat, they sort themselves out or space themselves out in these adjacent and overlapping home ranges. It's not this tiny, it's actually a lot sloppier. But the males have these very large home ranges. You can see the males rarely overlap, they overlap a little bit, but the females rarely overlap. Males overlap, but the females don't. This is exactly the opposite as it is with lots of which mountain lions. Mountain lions, the females are taller than each other, the males aren't taller. So that's, we don't know why that is. But male home ranges tend to be large, female home ranges are smaller, that's because they have kittens. And they can't move as much. Uh, a male bobcat life is driven by a constant search for the two Fs, food and females. The females spend most of their time <coughs> avoiding males. That sounds like human behavior, that's uh, probably a mistake. But, uh, uh, they also communicate with each other. These are called scrapes or scratches. If uh, we went out on the trails, I probably could find one of these within like 30 minutes. What it is, is they move their, their feet back and forth, and they create a little mound, and they urinate, or they defecate on that. That's a biological traffic signal. If it's a dominant male, robust male, this is an advertisement, my turf is male. If it's a less dominant male, it allows him to know where the other males are, and he can sort of navigate through as he's looking to establish his own home range. 
If it's a female with cubs, it allows her to avoid the male because he'll kill the cubs. Or if it's a female in heat, it allows her to find the male. So there's a lot more going on. If you, uh, if you really want to appreciate this, have you ever seen a cat walk up and sniff where another cat has peed? You ever see what the cat does? It gets this sort of lip curling grimace on its face and the lip curls up like this. That's called a Fleming response. And what it is is it's drawing the vapors from the urine over a special organ in the roof of its mouth. And what we think is going on is that each cat has an olfactory signature. In other words, you go, oh, that's great. So they can actually identify each one of their neighbors. But once again, to be consistent, if you really want to know if this is a bobcat straight, always look for the buck knife and the measuring tape. And I'll tell you that. They carry a lot of buck knives. They're the consummate hunter. They're very, very good hunters. Mountain lions hunt deer. Now, mountain lions, you've got to have deer. Now, bobcats, you've got to have rabbits. And uh, what deer, oh, well, look at that. This is why we have so many rabbits, because they're food for bobcats. And uh, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Nielsen down here in, in Illinois, that it's uh, actually, they eat about 30% about, uh, of their diet is rodents, and about 28% of the diet is rabbits. So they're about, about two pounds, that's, that's the package they're looking for, and the, food, and the food that they eat primarily. Now their skull, if we got one here, this, te this tells you a lot about how cats have evolved. Cats are the height, the height of carnivore evolution. Um, everything about them is about meat. They're meat eaters. Uh, sometimes I got friends who are a little misguided, they're, they're going to try and switch their domestic cat to a uh, Vegetarian diet, you'll kill them. You'll kill the cat because they are they are not built to eat vegetable material. Um, the how come I see boars uh, today eating the grass? That about ten percent of their diet is vegetation. That's what we call a digestive scour. It aids digestion, but they can't break the vegetable material down. But the best way is to look at their skull. Their skull is rounded. Have this rounded skull, so they've lost that uh, rostrum, is what it's called, and their schnozola is retracted back into their face. And they have this rounded skull, they have these massive muscles that wrap off their head and hook onto their jaw. But the, mo the most definitive characteristics are their teeth. They have these fangs or canines, but the most definitive tooth that will tell you something, the most definitive characteristic, dental characteristic, that tells you something is a carnivore is a carnassium. It's this tooth in the back of the mouth. If you take your jaw right now, you can move it side to side. Right? Cats can't do that. Their jaw only moves in one direction up and down. So you can try to do this to Boris and he'll remove your hand. I'll give the wrist. Because his jaw won't go back and forth. It only goes up and down. So one of the things you notice when you look at a cat, no molars. They don't chew their food. They can't. So what they, they do is their teeth have been modified. And this tooth right here slices past each other like a set of shears. So they have to cut up their food into chunks and swallow them whole. That's what this, uh, I'm cheating here. This is a cat of the lynx. And you can do it with your cat at home. If you find a, something too big for it to eat, give it this big chunk of meat. It's a smart cat. It'll turn its head to the side and bite. It's not a particularly bright cat. It'll still try to swallow them whole. But they'll usually try to do this. And, because they have to cut the meat up into pieces. So this is a good reason not to stick your finger in your cat's mouth, particularly towards the back. <laughs> we'll take it off like a razor. They tolerate snow. Um, everything about their senses, everything about a cat's senses. Um, I was talking to Rob today, and one of the things you have to realize about animals, people don't do that. We, we tend to compare them to, to us. And I, I want to tell you, they're nothing like us. Uh, they can hear into the ultrasonic range. They can see in one sixth the light level we can. If they attack their prey in pitch darkness, they can tell where the head is just by feeling the grain of the fur. So this is an animal that goes through life with senses so far extended beyond ours that it obviously sees a completely different reality than us. So you gotta, we you know, see ourselves in the hyper evolution. Well, not necessarily. In the sensory world, these animals are way beyond us. They are also the consummate parent. And with bobcats, they're the consummate single parent. Males have nothing to do with raising the young. And this is where I get a little kind of 
hard time to know what I'm majoring. Because uh, there's only three of the 38 species of cats I've mentioned, only three of them are social. Probably those are the ones we see all the time. African lion, the domestic cat, the male cheetah. All of the cats are solitary. Mating is, is the male's only function. And he mates, and then she runs them off, and she raises the young. Right? Now, I'm very proud of this photograph. This is not my photograph. This belongs to my friend David Griffin, probably one of the best field biologists I know. This is a courting pair of bobcats. And that's the female in the lead, and that's the male following her. And this is right along the Rio Grande River at a park called, brand new state park in New Mexico called the Mesilla Valley Bosque. And uh, they'll only do this for 24 hours, maybe 48 hours, 72 at the most. They make it, and then he's gone. And then she raises the young. Gestation is about two months. This is a very pregnant female. Um, and she'll give birth to anywhere about two to three. And it, it is on an annual cycle. And like people say, what's breeding season? Well, I can be anywhere from September to January. Where I'm from, where the, the climate is much more mild than it is here in Illinois, here in Illinois, it tends to shrink it. And you'll have mating in the late winter and they'll give birth in the spring. In New Mexico, where it's warmer, nobody would have known that when we got down to zero. <laughs> I know that's not a big thing in Illinois, but it took down all of our power generating plants. What, what is this thing called coal? I don't know, we don't deal with it very well. And that's when we get these little guys. Oh, come on. That's my they have blue eyes when they're born. And then they turn this golden brown. And we have no more. Mountain lions, same thing. Blue eyes, and then they turn, we don't know why that is. But they're mean little critters. <laughs> I had to babysit a pair of confiscated bobcats and just trash my apartment. <laughs> True, I'm a bachelor, and it didn't look that different, but it really did trash my apartment. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and this is sort of a, this is a, I like this shot. First Susan took this shot too. This is sort of New England bobcat in the fall. But this is a nice shot of a, a sort of a yearling. This is a teenager type bobcat. They'll reach maturity after about a year, but until they establish their own home ranges, and that takes place sometime during the second year. Now, how many of these things we got running around? Well, I got some impressive numbers up there, but this is where I'm going to immediately caution you because I want to emphasize there is no accurate way to census these animals, to count them over a large area. In game and fish, Department of Natural Resources here in Illinois will tell you that. Estimate, this is an estimate. And the way they came up with this is they sent up questionnaires to the game and fish department. And you have to understand, bobcats are only found in 47 states. And uh, so you got about uh, two and a half million to about three and a half million. And those estimates have gone up. Now, this is a minor point that I want to emphasize. Well, so they're increasing. Well, are they increasing? Is our ability to count them accurately getting better? In other words, do we have anything all along and we're just better at counting them? And when I say that to these PhDs, they kind of go, well, I haven't thought of that. So you've got to be careful when they tell you, when they throw these numbers out. Bottom line is, bobcats do seem to be rebounding and doing better, particularly here in Illinois. Here is, uh, out of that same study, we did these, those questionnaires that were sent out. Uh, to 47 states and Mexico and Canada. Bobcats are found all the way down to Oaxaca. And interesting is the sidelight baby global warming bobcats are spreading north, spreading the range north. But only uh, here in Delaware is the only place they're listed as absent. Only in Florida do they claim that they're decreasing. Uh, in all the other states, they're either increasing or stable. And uh, here in Illinois, they're, they're said to be uh, increasing. Um, the study done by Dr. Wolf and Dr. Nielsen and their graduate students was down here in the, in the southern 13 uh, counties, and, and this is where they came up with almost 2,200 bobcats, just for the southern end of the state. And this emphasized everything south of uh, Highway 64, and he concentrated on the Shawnee National Forest. So the concentration is here, here, and up in the northwest. What pattern do you see? Rivers, but what else? That's the western part of the state that's the most populated, or the eastern part of the state's most populated. So where there's people, there aren't any bobcats. So, you know, that's no big surprise. But bobcats do tolerate up 
fragments and landscape better than uh, Dr. Uh, Riley, that guy I showed you that was doing the National Park Service uniform that was working with us. He's doing a study smack dab in the middle of Los Angeles right now, where bobcats are doing the fly. <coughs> the most fragmented <coughs> landscape, I lived in LA for four years, and let me tell you, I saw a hit a lot of wow. I participated in a mountain land study in the middle of Los Angeles, which surprised a lot of people. But people don't realize about Los Angeles is how big it is. Because, you know, they'll say, well, how big it is. Los Angeles is 250 miles across. The city of Los Angeles is 250 miles across, and 150 miles north and south. Filled with mountain ranges. Well, mountain ranges are filled with wild. So, you know, even Chicago, I was uh, driving along the lakeshore today, and they're showing me all these arroyos that run out to the lake. You have a lot of wild life habitat. Look, look here. You know, even within the city itself. And animals that are tolerant, no, you're not going to have any rhinos running around. Oh, wait, farms, but they do have wild life. So, in Illinois, according to DNR, the population estimate, this is where I have to smile, the estimated statewide population of 2,200, well, uh, Clay and Allen came over that just for the southern end of your state. So you probably have more than that. Uh, habitat estimate, this is what they consider prime habitat. You have about 50,000, 55,000 square miles in the state. Population status is increasing. And the way they monitor this, and this is, you're, you're perfectly okay if you go to a fish and game meeting, the NR meeting, and they say, well, we came up with this number. It's okay to ask, how did you do that? How did you come up with the number? Because they will tell you what techniques they use. And techniques, there's a lot of them. Uh, Rob will tell you that some are more reliable than others. And the least reliable form of information on wildlife is sightings. That's what we call in science anecdotal information. Uh, so when people say, I can tell you, I saw a herd of mountain lions going down you know, Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And we look skeptical and so we don't believe me. I said, well, it's <laughs> Not likely. So the monitoring tip we used in Illinois are hunter surveys. And hunters are above average in their knowledge of the outdoors. But we were talking about sightings as they picked up the airport today, and the first thing we started talking about was sightings. And I so I ciphered in two statistics I use all the time. And that is, the California Department of Fish and Game did a study of 350 mountain lion sightings in the state of California, where we know we have lions. And these were really good sightings where somebody had a background as a naturalist or a ranger, uh, they know something, and then they went in and verified these sightings. Of the 350 sightings, how many were lions? How many were actually lions? Close, 12. 12 out of 350. I've been out on maybe 40, 50 verifications where somebody was home say, I got mountain lion running around in my backyard. Two were not. You can't trust sightings. I've given presentations just like this where I brought a live lion. Mountain lion. Stood there. 60% of the audience didn't know what it was. So it depends on how much knowledge you have of this, of this kind of stuff. Bobcats just sort of cringe. I think one of the things about this stuff is they're wondering what the heck is going on. I love this shot. Because you can see the pronounced white spot on the back of their ear. Boris, this is really pronounced for Boris. You get a chance to look at it. There's these white spots. And uh, here's an interesting adaptation. We think what this does is it's a lure for the kittens. A lot of the kittens to follow the mom. If you've ever watched kittens following African lions, the mom has that tuft of hair at the end of her tail. Cheetahs is the same thing. Kittens are always playing with their tail and following. They think that's an adaptation. Get the kids to follow. Bobcats in Illinois, here's a little timeline for you. Bobcats were trapped at one time. Uh, trapped and sold on the fur market, right, you know, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, sketchy information was available. They, they did keep records, but keep it. What happened in the 1970s? First day, I'm old enough, I remember, I went to my first Earth Day celebration when I was in high school. And uh, we became more aware, and a lot of state game and fish departments started monitoring this stuff more closely. And they changed the classification of a lot of animals. 1972, Illinois protected uh, the bobcat. It was, it was protected. But you know, there, any, there wasn't any research done to speak of. In 1977, it was put on the state threatened list. Not only do the feds keep track, not only do they keep a threatened and endangered list, individual states have their own system as well. Sometimes they're perhaps, sometimes they don't. Uh, 
But uh, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with your with the Illinois State and Army. They do a good job. Well, hard questions started to be asked in the 90s because people swore they were seeing more bobcats running around, particularly in the western part of the state. So Alan Wolf proposed the study in 1995 that went on until the early, about for the next eight years. And as a result of that study out of ISU in 1990, the bobcats were removed from the Illinois state threatened species list. Now, what happened next is kind of up to you. Because there have been proposals at almost every DNR meeting since then to open up traffic and hunting the bobcats. Because I'll tell you right now that, that scientifically, if you want the science, uh, the population here in Illinois could support a regulated form of harvest, is what they call it. But there are other forces at work outside of Illinois I want to talk to you about now, because now I've talked to you about bobcats in Illinois, and I've talked to you about bobcats in the United States. But there are forces outside of both of those countries that are going to affect what happens to bobcats more than what you do. Bobcats are exploited. Uh, this took me down a road in the research for my book I didn't expect. I went into the fur trade. Uh, the fur trade, how, how big was it? How important was it to the United States? I had no idea. It drew, it drew the geopolitical map of North America. That's what Spain, Britain, France were fighting about, was access to fur. Did you know that it was the number one industry during the 13 colonies, the fur, fur traffic? It wasn't farming, it wasn't, it wasn't fishing, it wasn't logging, it was furs. So it, it, economically, what I'm trying to tell you is that there's an economic component to fur, to fur traffic. And this is, uh, this is a leg hole trap. This is the technique. How, how big? We killed them by the tens of millions. I had no idea. I uncovered a research paper by some Canadian researchers, and they got hold of all the records of the Hudson Bay Company, the oldest multinational company in North America. It's been around for 400 years. And you know, the scale of we kill wildlife is just phenomenal. I'm not talking about beaver. I'm just talking about what I found out about bobcats. And uh, it's not nice. This is a Lego trap. We have another kind of trap called a conibear or a kill trap. It's a big square like rectangle like this. It's a scissor and they walk through it and collapses and it breaks their back and their neck. If it works properly. And uh, this is how, and usually what they do is these uh, traps trap the animal, then the trapper comes in and either shoots it or hides it over their head. That's how they harvest. This is why I'm concerned. At the last Western States fur auction in Columbus, Montana in 2001, in 1970, the most you could get for a bobcat pelt was $10. $571. So a pelt sold for. I've never seen prices like this. Prices for fur is through the roof. If you track what happened to the fur harvests, you see this big climb from like the 70s to 1987. In 1987, everything collapsed, everything dropped off. I mean, what happened in 1987? Any bankers in here? Stock market crash, the first one, not the most recent one. And in 1987, they put hundreds of furriers out of business. And it saved a lot of cats, probably. Because, and that was, those were economic forces. They had nothing to do with science. It was economics. Well now, guess what, everything's climbing. Because it used to be Italy, Greece, Japan, Germany imported most of the bobcats. Guess where it is now? China, Russia. That's where most of the are now. <coughs> so bobcats are probably wondering what's going to happen next, because even though they'll, they'll tell you here in Illinois, and if I probably sound like I'm lobbying, I do, right? I don't think trapping is a, is a good practice. You know, we can make a case for trapping on a scientific basis, but I'll be, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'll tell you, I think there's a moral question here. Is if you actually saw trapping take place and how it's done, uh, you sort of want to ask yourself, is, do we need to be doing this? I mean, is this necessary? So uh, here's why I'm concerned. Uh, there's no way to accurately census bobcat populations over a large area. I, I can't tell you that there's 2,252 bobcats. And even if we could, what does that mean? Let's compare to what? It's going to change. If we have fire, things will change. But this is the most important. Bobcat management has a profit motive. Economics drive bobcat harvest, not science. International trade in bobcats is increasing. As a matter of fact, it's increasing exponentially. I'll show you 
some numbers here in a minute. The U.S. has proposed removing the log cap from Appendix 2. So harvest is increasing, and they want to remove protection, even more protections. Bobcat belts cannot be distinguished from other links. This has the European examples. The United States made the proposal. The CITES people, they all get together every two years. It's called the Conference of the Parties. And the last one was in, uh, I never know how to pronounce this country, Qatar. The Qatar or Qatar over the Middle East. That's where the last meeting was. In the United States Court of Proposal Force, we want to remove the United States Bobcat from Appendix 2. Guess who said no? Everybody. All the other countries teamed up, particularly Russia. Russia stepped up for a while, it was kind of interesting, and said to the United States, no, because they're afraid that if bobcats are removed from Appendix 2 and there's not as close to monitoring them, the bobcat pelts will flood the market. True. And it will be easier to, it'll be easier to harvest Eurasian and even the endangered Spanish things. The Spanish government is out to fight this because they don't want it. As long as the bobcat stays protected, it protects their Spanish things. Bobcats are waiting, probably to see what we do next, because there's a lot of stuff going on. And here's some numbers for you. And just, this is just a four year. In uh, 2002, 2006, 2000, you know, two, 2008, uh, 280,000 bobcat pelts. These are just exports. We've exported to these countries. Next. Now, this is the international link strip 380,000. Now, this is not, pelts are not the only thing sold. We have a division within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that monitors all trade. These guys were a big help to me when I asked for data. They monitor everything that's exported. Bobcats make up 75% of the international market. So when someone says, oh, we're doing fine here in Illinois, well, yeah, but that has ramifications beyond Illinois. And this has, uh, if you, you want to go to an interesting website, go to the International uh, North American Fur Auction. And see what's happening with fur prices. They're, they're true. Ooh. And DNR will even tell you there's more and more trappers. And you cannot trap bobcats. You cannot trap bobcats in Illinois or, or uh, on the water and the bobcats are protected, but that could change. So there's a lot of people lobbying, obviously, and uh, selling trapping, uh, just so you know, fishing fees, hunting fees here in Illinois generated $16 million. So there's a monetary uh, arguments being made for selling licenses and traffic, but it does generate income for your Department of Natural Resources. But it, it, I think it asks a larger question, what do you want your DNR to be? So here's what I think is needed. We need to employ more reliable techniques for bobcat monitoring. Um, there's a lot of organizations that are recruiting people like you, drop doing it. It's called citizen science, where we're actually teaching. I can teach people how to track. And it's not to tell you so you can go out and say, I know that I have this many bobcats in my neighborhood, but you can say, well, I know they're here. Well, frankly, you know, you can, and I, I am seeing this many bobcats, you know, when I go out and run these transits on you know, a monthly basis. And uh, ensure the bobcat harvest is based on science and not economics. If you want to know how bad this can get, and I'm pretty negative, I just left a state agency in New Mexico, and, and how politics can call off science. New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, sponsored the largest mountain lion study ever done. Ten-year study in the San Andreas Mountains. Kenny Logan and Linda Swain, her husband and wife, they studied lions for ten years. And they financed federal government's head. But the state put up the money. And New Mexico is not known for being progressive as well as management. And they produced a fantastic book and a great big report and a whole list of recommendations, all of which were completely ignored by the Fish and Game Commission. So it's legitimate for you to go to these meetings and ask, is our management being based on the science? Because if they tell you go, of course, which they will, it's OK for you to ask that, that next question. So I'm big for supporting these non-governmental organizations, like the Wildlife Discovery Center. And I would really vote to retain Bobcats on Appendix 2. All that does is require the people who trade Bobcats here is that we monitor the trade. We keep close track of it. It doesn't restrict it. Can. It's a, this at least just keep track of what we're doing. I'm sure bobcats don't care. I mean, they're too busy being bobcats, right? I mean, they, they don't really care um, what we do. Yeah, and I often get asked, people say, what's the big deal, Kevin? Bobcats, bobcats really are doing well. I think uh, your, your DNR, my New Mexico Game and Fish, need to 
get a pat on the back because they, they've done a pretty good job of managing broadcasting. So, so what's the big deal? They're not in danger. Why do we need to worry? Well, everybody thinks declaring something in danger is an easy thing to measure. Like I can tell you exactly. Here's this animal. This animal is, the animal is doing well, and now it's not. And we can tell you exactly where that line is. We can't. So we're ahead of the game. It's not in trouble. And we're in a position to make sure it never is. So we'll keep it that way. That's what I would advocate. I'd like to read you something now, if I may, just to wrap this up, since you're so riveted. <laughs> I spent a lot of time writing about Bobcats. But, uh, the Bobcat has evolved for millions of years to do one thing. It kills. And that's neither good nor bad. It's simply what it is. Where, female, where the feline gets into trouble is when we hold it to a human standard. Uh, but the bobcat does not live in our world. Lynx Rufus moves throughout a landscape of sights, sounds, and odors that explores with extended senses so far superior to ours that it creates a reality, a reality humans can really fathom. This is what makes cats appear so otherworldly, so mysterious. Love a mystery. It drives both the biologist's research and the layperson's imagination. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hello, hello. He's, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. We're trying to, well, you know what we're doing. Um, uh, what are they used for? They're used for jackets, coats. They're used for trim, you know, along. Uh, they're, they're quite a fashion thing. Probably one of the most fashionable things right now with women, particularly young women in Russia, is to have a full-length bobcat coat. And just so you know, they use very little of the pelt. All they use is the belly. If you look to Boris out here, he has a white spotted pelt. And what they'll do is they'll cut those and then they'll shape them so it's symmetrical. So it can take from 16 to 20 bobcat pelts to make a short, just a short coat. So it's a fashion statement mostly. Yes. Well, people, I, I spent a lot of time explaining the difference. It's a different species. You know, uh, my, my college, my college, uh, mascot. I went to Weber State University in Utah, and uh, they have the big they have a big statue out front, and they say this is the this is the North American lynx. And I go, well, there is no lynx. It's the it's the bobcat. The lynx is the candle, and you know you get into you, you, they think you're splitting hairs. No, they're different animals. So we biologists can say that because we know these things. So, other question, sir. To, to, to emphasize something about how many you have, how big your home ranges are, that really varies. Because home ranges can be as small as several acres to square miles. And it depends on how much prey is available, what the cover is like. Cover, everybody know what I mean by cover? Cover is uh, vegetation that they hide in while they're stalking their prey. Of the 38 species of cats, only one chases its prey down. What's that? The cheetah. All other, very good. You get, you, get a, you get extra points. Uh, all other cats are stalking and ambush predators. They have to get close, and then they ambush from a short. Bobcats are also lay predators. They'll, they'll, they'll set up what's called a lay. They'll lay along a trail and wait for things to come along. So uh, depending on how many rabbits, if you've got lots of rabbits, 
You probably got lots of bobcats. It's this whole thing about, well, bobcats are wiping out the rabbit population. Well, actually, it's a chicken and egg. It's a chicken and egg. Yeah, I, would, I agree with you. Where I, li where I live, it's white, it's white winged doves. I got white winged doves coming out of my ears, and I don't think the raptors are doing their job. They, they really need to be eating more white winged doves. It's, it's really out of hand. Yes, ma'am. Excellent question. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't cover that. Uh, they are crepuscular and nocturnal. Translation, dawn, dusk, and night. Uh, does this mean it's unusual to see one running around in the middle of the day? Not necessarily, particularly if it's a female with cubs. They'll be more active around the clock. But they move when their prey moves. You don't normally have rabbits you know, moving in the middle of the day. It's dawn, dusk, and usually at night. Where I live, it's very, very hot in the summer, even hotter than Illinois, believe it or not. And the, bu the busy time is in the middle of the night. So Right. Right. There aren't a lot of diurnal animals on Earth. It's always surprising. I have a, I've developed a whole display at a nature center in New Mexico to explain to kids because they'll come out in the, you know, I pray, I beg, I ask teachers, bring the kids out early in the morning. They always show up in the middle of the day, right at noon. Well, how come I don't see anything? Well, hardly anything moves around when it's 170 degrees out. You know, they like it a little bit cooler. But people will come to the zoos. They'll come to the zoos in the middle of the day, and they'll say, well, how come the mountain lion isn't out? And it's because, you know, I scared the bejesus out of my sister because I got us into the Salt Lake City Zoo in the middle of the night, and she was just, the place is like Grand Central Station. The place is busy. At night is when things happen with animals. It's just, we're the kind of the unusual. Yes? Isn't it cute? Have those little tufts on the end of their ears? We have no idea. In lynx? Uh, if you look at a lynx, really, uh, Canada lynx, it's even more pronounced. She's, ta she's asking about the tufts in their ears. We think it aids their hearing. It helps them collect sound a little bit better. I think it's just kind of cool. You know, it's just kind of a, hey. You know, so, and, I, and we do have, uh, everybody's seen a Manx cat? Like it's a breed of domestic cat. They have kind of a tuft. And there's another cat, which they thought was in the lynx family for a long time until they recently redid the taxonomic charts. There's a cat running around in Africa called a caracal. And it has really, really pronounced, it's, it's even a little bit bigger than a bobcat, and it has those tufts that stick out. But it's a case of parallel evolution, it's not the same. Somebody had a question in the back? No? Yes? You said that they, the natural predator uh, has two dogs and cats. Is it mm -hmm. the one, and I don't know if you're the one that... Uh, Sometimes they do. Oh, okay. I don't know what the status of coyotes are in Illinois. You got them, I know that. Um, but it's, um, it's interesting. I, I talk about it a little bit in the book. Uh, this, is, this is, matter of fact, my favorite story in the book is uh, Billy the Bobcat, which is this bobcat. A friend of mine, Don Simus, she has this bobcat she uses for demos. And she can use him because he's, he's retarded. He's actually a freak. And she talks about how he's not your typical bobcat. First of all, he's bigger. And that's because he's a fur farm. He's a fur farm bobcat. Yes, fur farming of bobcats is legal in the U.S. They actually raid them and kill them and take the fur that way. The other thing is he's really friendly. Bobcats are not friendly by nature. They'll, they'll remove your face. They do not like people. I know guys that will deal with tigers and jaguars and circuses and that. They say, I'd rather deal with a Bengal tiger than a bobcat because they're just all attitude. They're lots and lots of attitude. So uh, there's some work on the interactions between bobcats and coyotes. And uh, the reaction I give you is this one of these sort of non-committal, it depends on the bobcat, because bobcats will kill and eat coyotes. Coyotes will eat, kill and eat bobcats. Uh, I talked to Sue up in New England where they have these big rocky uh, uh, faces and broken country, and bobcats really like that. They're real good climbers, and frequently they'll use that to get away from bobcats. They'll get up on these rock faces. It's a different kind of cover. Uh, Seth Riley did a study between bobcats and foxes, and, and that's an interesting interaction. It's, a, it's an area that's being studied right now because the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone has turned our predator-predator assumptions on its head because we haven't studied how predators interact with each other. But the wolves are basically kicking grizzly bears' butts, and they didn't expect that. And Bob, where coyotes had moved into Yellowstone and filled that niche, wolves are taking it right back. Wolves are killing coyotes left and right. And whereas if one-on-one, uh, -on -one, a wolf is no match for a mountain lion, but in a wolf pack, 
There have now been three documented cases of mountain lions being killed by wolf packs. So it's something we don't know a lot about because it's really hard to study. And we need to know more about it. Yes? That's called a generalist. Daffodil bulbs, your cat. Uh, <laughs> you're going to find that, and that's an excellent point. What you're going to find is that uh, canids, canines, we use the term canids, canids and felids, felines and uh, canines. Canines uh, are more what we call generalists. They're, they're digestive. If there's a collapse in prey, canines can switch over to vegetable material. You'll see, you'll see manzanita berries in, in coyote scat or fox scat. They can eat it and digest it. Cats cannot. Cats are pure meat eaters. So when it comes to those kinds of things, dogs are a little bit better adapted. It's fascinating to study the parallel. Why, why have dogs evolved the way they have and why have cats evolved the way they have? Even behaviorally, there's some stuff that's really fascinating for two animals that sort of start life the same way, and then they take these two divergent cats behaviorally about, you know, what they do. Sorry. <laughs> yes. When do they mature? When do they mature? They're usually mature at one year. At one year. Uh, sexually mature, but uh, they usually won't have cubs till usually their second year. So females, females and that's not because they're not capable. Uh, it's just that uh, they want the, the key to whether or not they have young is the possession of a home range. They have to have a home range because a home range is an established hunting territory and they can't survive without it. So uh, Alway Farms would probably support a bobcat, maybe two. You know, that would that, be just a, a guess. What is their lifespan? What is uh, their lifespan? Their lifespan? It's interesting. Hard to measure because unless you catch them as a kitten in the wild and measure it, but I think it's quite similar to mountain lions. And what we have found is a 10-year-old lion or a 10-year-old bobcat is extremely rare. Life is tough, particularly if you're a female because you've got, you got kids to feed and you're attacking prey that's quite capable of killing you. So, you know, you can get hurt attacking prey. In captivity, They've lived in, excels, in excess of 25 years. But the key in the wild is teeth. How long they can hold on to their teeth, particularly their canines. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the oldest cat documented in Clay and Allen's study was 13 years. That was an old bobcat. So 10-year cat, that's an old bobcat. I know a study done by a real good friend of mine, Rick Hopkins, a mountain lion study of an un harvested population where people weren't <laughs> shooting them, where they were just allowed to exist on their own, and rarely did they survive past eight years. Because it's a hard life out there. Think of it, uh, mountain lions, if you, a mountain lion per frequently is taking prey much bigger than they are. The deer is perfectly capable of killing a mountain lion. Whereas bobcats are dealing with rabbits, and you don't think of rabbits, until I picked up my girlfriend's lop eared the other day, and he kicked me right in the groin. Gotta be careful with rabbits. They can take care of themselves. <laughs> big feet. Really big feet. Yes? No, they don't. It's a very, let me repeat the question. She wants to know when they're trapping. If a good trapper knows what he's doing, they're. <coughs> Uh, it's actually fairly closely regulated, and guys that are conscientious trappers will set traps of a certain size, and then they have to check those traps a certain, it's usually once a day, usually. The traps have to be identified, they have to have the owner's name on it. Removing one's traps is illegal. If you go in, so you find a guy's <coughs> trap, and you try, that's illegal for you to do that, because he can legally trap in most states. Uh, but uh, is it, uh, the term, the frequent term is, will it take non-target animals? Oh yeah, raptors frequently get caught in traps. And it depends also on how they're baited. Sometimes they're baited. The thing that works with bobcats are what are called sensory baits. One of the best things that work with bobcats are feathers or a pie tin, you know, because they're curious and not real bright. So 
Sometimes you can lure them into what's called a cubby set, which, so yeah, no, it's not particularly. Oh yeah. Only if somebody knows about it, and I forget it, I actually read it, you have 164 game wardens for the state of Illinois. So what's that? Illinois is a big state. So you got one game warden per couple hundred square miles. And by the way, your game wardens are responsible for the crime 24 hours. It's not like NYPD Blue when the new shift comes on at 5. I was a ranger and nobody came in at the end of my shift. I, I, I was being called out in the middle of the night. And by the way, anybody know what the most dangerous law enforcement profession is in the world? Game warden. You're working alone. You're encountering people with high-powered weapons that they know how to use. You have no backup. Chicago Metro is not going to back you up out in the middle of you know, the cornfield in western Illinois. So, and wardens frequently work alone. So it's very, very much more dangerous than an urban. If something happens, Chicago PD, supposedly one of the best police departments in the United States, usually you can count on somebody backing you up within a couple minutes. <coughs> wardens don't have that luxury. I worked as a ranger, a law enforcement ranger for a number of years, and that's number two after game wardens. <laughs> you know, it's, so it, it can be quite dangerous. Other questions? Yes. Oh yeah, they love those rock ledges. Yeah. If the crows aren't paying attention, you bet. <laughs> They'll snag one. Does anybody know what she's talking about? It's called mobbing. Crows will do it. Ravens? Ravens will do it. Ravens will do it. Birds will, you know, even small. Robins do it. Uh, usually with predators. We have a, excuse me, we have a red-tailed hawk out here. They get mobbed all the time uh, by the little guys. There's force in numbers. So, other questions? Yes. Did you say that the male will be cubs? Yes. So, what if the female, the female then, to protect the cubs, has to stay out of his territory? No, she, she has to hide the cubs from him. He actually protects her in his area, but she still keeps the cubs away from him individually. Is there ever a male-female fight? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's probably the old male. Females are frequently killed defending their, defending their cubs. But again, how do you, how do you attract that? Uh, I hate to keep using mountain lion examples, but it's the, there was this big study, Kenny and Linda, this husband and wife here in New Mexico. We used to think fighting never took place among uh, mountain lions because we rarely found it. But in New Mexico, it was the number one source of death. Well, what are they fighting about? Well, we thought they were fighting about resources, access to food. It was access to females. The males, the males were killing each other to access to females. So that's how important it is to males to have access to females. So, and that probably changes depending on the area you're at. They're, they are, the term in science is they're very plastic in their behavior. They're very adaptable. I worked at this wildlife recovery center and these are captive lions. But we did have two ones we got out of the wild. And I watched them all day. I sat and watched a mountain lion all day and bobcats all day and I'll tell you this. They have moods, they problem solve, and they're always watching you. They're always watching. It's like that scene at the Science of the Lambs. And they take Lecter off and they says, I hope they're watching him because he's watching them. <laughs> I did an experiment on my sister. She's never forgiven me. <laughs> we were at the Salt Lake City Zoo in winter. And uh, we went up to, and the best place to go, best time to go to a zoo is after a good snowfall. Because animals love the snow. And these two young males, siblings, siblings I think, were in the back of the enclosure. And she said, oh, you can't get a very good, you know, look. And she knows not to trust me after spending a life together. And she goes, I said, would you like to see him get closer? <laughs> she goes, what? And I says, oh, trust me, trust me. <laughs> so she was looking at him, and they always look. They always look nonchalant, like they're not paying attention. They're always paying attention. You're not, but they always are. Even when they're not looking at you, they're watching you. And so I turned her around, and we just turned our back to the lions. I put my arm around her, and it took 
45 seconds? We, I mean, we backed up against the outer rail, and I says, okay, turn around, turn around. He was right there. <laughs> <She's>, ah! <laughs> so they pay attention to you not paying attention. That's how they survive. And this is one of the things that uh, I, when people say, well, how should I behave out in the wild? You know, Rob works, it works in the herp world, it works everywhere. What's the rule? Pay attention. Always pay attention. And if you see trackers, one of the things about Sue is she'll shush you. Say, well, what about, shh, I'm working. She's tracking. It's an active process. So when people go to the outdoors and, hey, I want to relax, I want to enjoy myself, sure. But there's stuff out here that'll kill you if you're not paying attention. And the prey that doesn't pay attention is dinner. So we, we talk about how, what animals can do, but there's a whole new area of science called, well, it's not new, it's been around a long time, but we used to call it animal behavior. We now, and not being satisfied with simple names, we've given it a new name, and the new name is cognitive ethology and animal behavior. And we have learned so much about how animals behave. And so it's either instinct or there's a lot more going on. And I'll tell you right now, bobcats, I was just watching Boris. And we ha he, uh, Rob put a, a catnip plant in the, in the enclosure. They love catnip. They really love catnip. <laughs> and uh, they use it to bait traps. They'll actually isolate catnip oil. Some trappers will use catnip oil to bait traps to draw in bobcats. So I'm going to be around if there's any other questions. We got cookies. Try to save some for me. I never get any of the cookies. So.